Okay. Yeah. So what we got here is the Budget and General Appropriations Act. Uh, it has to pass. Some budget has to pass. The consequences of not passing a budget is the state government shuts down. Yeah. Right? Because this thing only has effect for one fiscal year. Yeah. And the state, no, no state agency is authorized to write any checks to anybody to do anything, you know, without this thing being in effect. So, um, there, uh, so when you open it up, there's, um, it's, a, it's organized into several sections. So the part one are temporary provisions of law. And that's, when I say temporary, meaning it only applies for one fiscal year. So from, from fiscal years from July 1st to June 30th. Um, and then, so it, part one is divided up in two sections. So part 1A is all the line items. Um, so the individual fiscal budgets all their line items for each of a number of state agencies. Uh, and then um, in between part 1A and part 1B, there's a recapitulation. If you want a summary, a line item summary of each agency budget, this is where you go to look. So these are the bottom lines for each agency. So Department of Education, um, last year's budget on the left is total funds $5.1 billion. Um, this year's proposal total funds five point three billion dollars. Okay. Um, you can pull this up on the website, and usually what I do every year is I will go and I'll show you where to do that in a minute. But I'll go on the website and I will copy and paste that entire recapitulation into a spreadsheet, and then I'll set up some um, you know some additional columns to you know go ahead and automatically figure the difference, so I know how much we're increasing you know over last year and so forth. So, but the recapitulation is super helpful. Um, and then at the bottom of the recapitulation, page 264, um, is where you get the grand total of the entire budget. So if you're wondering, okay, what is the grand, what is the total bottom line? Last year, which was 2020, 2021, 29.5 billion. This year it's 30.2 billion. It's a six hundred and ninety four million dollar increase over over the last budget um, now uh, I'll come back to that in a minute if we keep going you'll see there's a statement of revenue so where are we getting all our money this is if you're wondering that this is what we this this is the breakout of where we're getting all the money that we have available to spend for the general fund only for the general fund only there's a distinction between general funds and everything else. And that's why throughout part 1A, you'll see two columns. You'll see total funds and general funds. Okay. So general funds means all these taxes that we've got. So sales and use tax, income tax, corporate income tax, on down the line, those go into one big pot of money, which is known as the general fund. Um, and then we get, we, you know, we, we spend that here. Um, and, you know, the total general fund expenditures, which you can see in the recapitulation section, the total is, in this budget, is $8.9 billion. So that means right here on 264. Gotcha. Um, total see it down there at the bottom right? So... That $8.9 billion there, that of course isn't the whole entire budget. The total budget is $30.2 billion. So that means there's 22, 21 something odd billion dollars coming from somewhere else. Gotcha. Well, where's that money coming from? That money's coming from a variety of sources. So it includes, so other funds in South Carolina includes all fines, all fees, so like, you know, you want to be a barber, you got to pay a fee, gotcha. you know, to obtain a license. You know, that's, that goes into a total, in the total funds column separate from general funds. Total funds includes general funds, by the way. So if you want to figure how much other funds are, you, you have to, it. you have to figure the difference between the two columns. Um, that's one of many complaints I have about the way this is laid out. It, you know, they should break it out for you, mm -hmm. but anyway. Um, there's other things, all federal funds get included in that total funds column. Uh, 
here's one you wouldn't expect. All tuition for all of our colleges is included in the total funds. You'll see all the colleges and universities have a really large total funds budget. They have a significantly smaller general funds budget. So that's, that's why. Uh, let's see, what else? Another thing that's hidden in here that, that isn't called out at all, you'd have to ask staff for this uh, or possibly go and look on the Ways and Means Committee website and find the budget presentations for each of these state agencies to, to see, if they're, see if it's included there. But each of these agencies, they have money in the bank already. They have a fund balance. So how much is there? You, you have to ask someone to find that. Well, let me give you one relevant example here. Let's take our own budget for the House and the Senate. So I found out last year or the year before, okay, so page 217, section 91B is the House budget. Uh, last year's budget was total 20, uh, $23 million, and that's not really being changed in this budget, so it's still $23 million. Mm -hmm. I found out that they actually have, at the time, something like a $25 million fund balance. So like we could zero out the entire house's budget and, we'll still and still operate. Now, why would we have such a large fund balance? Do we need to have such a large fund balance? Do we need to appropriate this much money to the house? You know, those are all open questions, but if you, if you know, then you know. Right. So I say that because if there's something different you want to do with the money, that's where you go looking for money. Okay, first of all, find out what, how much do they actually need, and that, that's going to depend on, you know, how much they have it on hand versus how much they plan to spend. So you may hear reference on occasion to hidden pots of money. That's the kind of thing that that refers to. Somebody did the research, did the homework, and found out that somebody has a bunch of money sitting around that they're not doing anything with. Like a reserve fund. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes there are really good reasons for them to have a large uh, reserve fund balance. So that's, or, or large fund balance. So there's, you know, you got to take that into account and make sure you research that. Um, the Senate was just as bad, um, if not worse. So they also have a very large fund balance. Probably still do. I don't, I just don't know what the current figure is. Okay, so just those are some examples. So, all right, you're so, gonna ask and get the real number. Yeah, you can ask. You can ask. Uh, Ways and Means staff should be able to provide that. Yeah. Um, Daniel Bone, or he can redirect it to you know somebody under him if, if there's someone better to do it. Uh, you can also go through the governor's office. The governor's staff can sometimes give you those answers, mm -hmm. uh, especially if it's an executive branch agency. Um, all right, so part 1A, line items, then recap summarizes part 1A. Uh, and then you've got the statement of revenues. Another thing to, that's really crucial to know is that we have a balanced budget amendment in the state constitution. But believe it or not, um, while we, in theory, do balance the budget in terms of not spending more money than we expect to have come in, it's not truly a balanced budget in terms of we don't actually know how much is gonna come in. So we don't actually know how much we're gonna to have to spend in a given year because what we're doing is we're budgeting a year ahead, not a year behind. We're using the tax dollars, we're spending the tax dollars that we think are going to come in in the next year, which as you might imagine, sometimes poses a problem. So when the 2007 budget was written, for instance, you know, based on a rosy outlook on the economy, uh, and then all of a sudden this, the housing bubble burst, and then all of a sudden it's very big, pic very different picture. It created a $2 billion deficit in the planned budget mid-year. And they had to come back and cut the budget across the board by like $2 billion. And then there's like the federal government got involved in various things like that. But point being, you will hear, now who's the authority for providing these figures? These, and, the, and understand that these are estimates. So last year's numbers, aren't estimates because we know what those right. actual numbers are now after the fact, but the upcoming numbers are all estimated. 
So we don't actually know if it's going to be that figure, if it's going to be something else. So who's the authority? Well, the authority is Revenue and Fiscal Affairs. They're the state agency that has the authority to go and provide what they think these numbers are going to be in the next fiscal year. And then in May, they're going to revise those numbers. And they may revise them up or they may revise them down. And so when you hear in the media or you hear staff talking or the chairman talking about a budget surplus, what they're talking about is the, the estimate got revised upward, which means that um, we now have, more. we expect to have more money come in than we planned on, which means we can spend that money somehow or make plans to spend that money somehow or not. You know, it's there's no requirement, but sometimes that happens. Uh, and, and of course, sometimes it goes the other way, in which case we may need to go and cut some line items in order to, you know, make things balanced. All right. Um, and you'll see this on page 267, Board of Economic Advisors Estimate, Ways and Means Committee Estimate. You'll see that when the budget process first started, the, there was a February 12th, 2021 estimate. And then on March 4th, it was revised. And that was the estimate that this document is based on. So when, when the Ways and Means Committee made their budget, they were using the, the numbers from March 4th, not February 12th. All right, so any questions on that before I move on to Part B? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so that's Part 1A. So that's fully half the budget document. Part 1B are temporary provisions of law. So Part 1A is how much we're going to spend. Part 1B can, can be many things, but generally speaking, uh, it's instructions to state agencies of what to do with the money that we just gave them in Part 1A. Um, so these are also these are what we call provisos, and they're broken out into sections that correspond to sections in Part 1A. So, for instance, Section 1 is the Department of Education. Part 1B of Section Section 1 of Part 1B is going to be provisos related to the Department of Education, and then they're broken up into individual numbers of so 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. Think of these as individual laws. Okay. And sometimes these get rolled over from budget year to budget year to budget year. These only these only apply for the fiscal year. Not longer than that, not shorter than that. Um, and and so that's why some of these are repeated with no changes, is because you know there's nobody requested any change and they want to keep keep those instructions in place for this year just as they were for last year. You'll see changes indicated in here with underlines or strike throughs showing where changes are being made. And along those lines, instead of flipping through this entire document and finding all the provisos that were changed, they actually provide a handy little index of that, which you can get on the website. Um, and to, to get that, you would go to scstatehouse.gov and you would go to House Committees, Ways and Means, click on Ways and Means, and then there's Budget Summary Documents right down here near the bottom of the page. Budget Summary Documents 2021-2022 provides a list. You click on that, this is going to list out all the provisos just by a, a summary name only, and any that are in italics are going to be the ones that got changed or added or, or something like that. Um, so there, there's that. Um, so you can kind of uh, get some idea of where the changes are happening and which ones are the same as before. Uh, proviso summaries, the next document. This lists a summary of only the, the provisos that have changed. So for instance, um, section one, Department of Education, proviso 1.3, they're changing it. This is, how, this is a description of how they're changing it. Um, and then it says WMC, which stands for Ways and Means Committee. Um, it's a summary of the, um, uh, you know, of, of what the committee proposes to change it to. And then 1.7 is getting deleted. 1.8 is getting changed. Here's what the, here's how they're changing it and so forth. So this is definitely a document to read over uh, at a minimum. Gotcha. And, and then you can cross-reference between this with the actual language in Part 1B to see the full le actual legal language of, you know, what the proviso so is going to say. Yeah. No, this is just a description. Okay. This is helpful, but this is not the legal language of what the proviso is going to say. It's just a description of what it says. Um, all right. 
we'll come back to that. So part one B, you got all these all these things. Now usually most of these are not these are going to take these are going these are instructions for how the line items in part 1A get spent. So what the agencies are, are to do with it. However, especially when you get near the end, um, there are usually provisos that do spend money that in ways that are not listed in part 1A. Um, so where you usually find that is gonna be get to it. Section 118, I believe. Yeah. All right. Section 118. So on page 529 of the budget, uh, this year's budget. So it's proviso 118.18. It's usually near the end of 118. Um, the actual number of the proviso may vary from time to time. So we talked about the all, all those tax revenues that go into the general fund mm -hmm. a minute ago. That's what's known as recurring revenue. There's another form of revenue called non-recurring revenue. And non-recurring revenue are going to include a number of things. But for instance, let's say South Carolina was involved in some sort of settlement where some major corporation broke state law and then they had to pay a bunch of fees and fines and stuff like that. And let's say they had to pay the state of South Carolina $25 million for some misdeed of theirs. Well, that's going to go into the pot of non-recurring non revenue for the year. Thing. For the year, it's one time, yeah. And so, well, how do we, how do, we, what do we do with that money? And um, so, Proviso one eighteen point eighteen addresses that, and this actually tells you what that non-recurring revenue is. So, on line sixteen, it says we've got uh, leftover from the 2018-2019 contingency Re reserve fund. We have one hundred three point five million dollars. Uh, from in undesignated unreserved funds, we have 463.5 million. Check with staff on that. What I think that means is money was allocated to state agencies that they didn't use. Um, and so it's still hanging out there in the in the general fund unused and, and is available to be reallocated. Um, Debt service lapse, so 2020 to 2021 debt service lapse, 125 million. Um, that uh, that may be bo uh, state bonds that we've paid off, and so we that frees up money that we no longer have to put towards debt payments, uh, or it may be something else. This is non-recurring, so that's that's probably incorrect. It's probably something else. Check with staff on what debt service lapse is specifically. Um, but I'll come back to that because there's a, another proviso dealing with debt service. Um, line 19, 36 million from projected fiscal year 2020, 2021, an obligated general fund revenue is certified. So basically this, there's a small $36 million surplus, 51 million left over from CARES Act reimbursements. Unspent. So that's the list of what we have to spend and you can add that up to get the total. They don't state the total in this proviso. And then starting on line 30, it says the state's treasurer shall disperse these funds for the purposes stated. And, you know, we start listing out, okay, uh, office of the attorney general is going to get hurricane Dorian, uh, cost share money, $12.7 million and going on down the list, all these different agencies get money, 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 money. And then on page 531, near the bottom of the page, on line 34, it says, unexpended funds appropriated may be carried forward um, and expended for the same purposes. So if the state agency doesn't use all that money, they don't lose it, they get to keep it, they get to continue using it the next fiscal year. It goes into their fund balance for the following year. So that's how they get those, these fund yeah. balances sometimes, is they don't use all the money. These, the non-recurring revenue that we just went over. Yeah. On page 529. Now those numbers, since that's still the reserve, is that included? Would that be included in the total, the budget for this? That'll be included in that number. In the uh, recap. Yeah, like the um, for this fiscal year, the total uh, budget. 
is that part of that money you were saying that, you know, it'll say we got so much money, but all of it's not listed in the general fund? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yes, I believe it is. Um, but this document doesn't show how that all works together. Yeah. There's a separate document that I'll show you in a minute that shows how all that works together. Okay. Um, okay. So let me just let me just explain a couple of relevant points related to this. So sometimes this proviso is where earmarks will show up. That was going to be my next question: How to find the earmarks? Sometimes it'll be in this list. Gotcha. Um, there's also by is it state law or house rule? I think it's house rule. Uh, they're required to earmarks have to be requested on a certain form, and then a report of all requested earmarks have to be provided. Um, that's supposed to be it's supposed to be here on the website, um, and there may not be any earmark requests. That may be why there's there's not one listed. But confirm that with staff, mm -hmm. and uh, ask them where to find that that report because they're required to provide it to us before second reading on this, um, if there are any. Uh, another thing. So you can't spend money that you don't have, right? right? Basic rule, that's anything less than that would introduce deficit spending into the budget. So if you're going to spend some money on something, you gotta state where you're getting it. Now there's some flex in that, there's some wiggle room. Uh, the house rule, uh, five point something, you can look it up. By the way, where do you go to find the house rules? You go to the house tab, on the top here, rules, and then house rules. I like to use the PDF so I can control F and search. Um, so appropriations. Appropriations. Spelling helps. <laughs> um, right, so it's gonna be you should just do this and do do a search for appropriations bill and read all the relevant okay, rules. Gotcha. But a lot of them are in House Rule 5.3. Um, and this deals with, you know, germaneness of amendments. That's a really important one to understand. Um, and a few other things. So. This is uh, this is where the earmark rule is 5.3 F. That's that's the earmark rule. Um, there's a there's a rule in here that says that if you don't state where the money's coming from, okay. then it's not germane. Okay. And if I catch if I catch you putting up an amendment that spends more than a million dollars that doesn't state where the money's coming from then I will stand up and make a point of order and rule the thing out of, out of order. <laughs> I'm just a stickler about that stuff. <laughs> I've, it's happened. Yeah. It's happened. Do your basic homework and know these things beforehand. Um, now, if it's less than a million dollars, if it's 10 grand or 500 grand or something like that, mm -hmm. you don't have to state where the money's coming from. However, I don't recommend doing that. So it's you're allowed to do that, but what's gonna happen is you've now increased the total spending of the of the bill by that much if it passes. Right. And what that means is that after we're all done going all the way through and voted on all amendments and we're to the end of the process, before second reading, what's gonna happen is the chairman of Ways and Means, Merle Smith, is gonna get with staff and get with his committee and figure out what the deficit is, the total deficit, and then he's gonna cut okay. something somewhere in the budget that set to in order to make up the difference. And the question is, do you want him doing that for you or do you want to do it yourself? Because you may or may not like where he chooses to cut it, mm -hmm. uh, but he has to in order to make it balance. So that's so why it's usually not a good idea to try to put up an amendment that doesn't state where the money's coming from. Okay. Um, so, all right. What else, what else do we need to cover here? Um, ah, let's talk about debt service. 
Section 108. Let's look at part 1A first. I believe it's section 108. Or maybe 105. Let's see here. Debt service. Uh, section 112. So it's page 256. So there's a bunch of different ways for the state to incur debt. General bonds are backed by the taxing power of the state. And there are some limitations on that. There's a debt, debt limitation, a debt ceiling for South Carolina that we can't exceed. I think it's in the Constitution. Um, there are um, there are some legal restrictions on what you can and can't do with these. By the way, um, there's a there's a different type of bond other than general obligation bonds, and those are known as revenue bonds. And so this isn't going to capture the full debt payments that the entire state's making. These are specifically just general obligation bonds, okay. uh, and then a few other miscellaneous items. So, for instance, the University of South Carolina. Um, has the ability to go out and use tuition or other non-tax sources of recurring revenue and use that as a basis to uh, borrow money, which they may do for building a new building or any number of things. Uh, and those are known as revenue bonds. By the way, <laughs> the VC summer debt, that was those were revenue bonds. So they were using the base of the 2007 Baseload Review Act increased, allowed, allowed Santee Cooper to raise rates mm -hmm. and other utilities to raise rates and then use that to borrow money. That's how that situation got set up. And so, you know, for, uh, I mean, it was many billions of dollars in, in debt that still has to be paid off somewhere. Yeah. So that, by the way, that's an example of a revenue okay. bond. Uh, but that said, and we have to approve revenue bonds, right? Or not? Those, that's what they can use. That, have staff on that. Um, there are some things that have to be approved by the Joint Bond Review Committee, which is a separate state agency of sorts, um, jointly composed of like the Chairman of Ways and Means, the Chairman of Senate Finance, uh, Comptroller General, State Treasurer, and I think the Governor, I think are the five people that sit on the JBRC. Um, but anyway, so general obligation bonds, general obligation bonds, obviously we have to make these payments to fail to do so would put the state in default. Um, so this is a very, very high priority, uh, area of spending of, of the state and, um, we can sacrifice other things. We cannot sacrifice this. Now that said, we have routinely overpaid. Uh, we've been doing that at least as long as Haley, maybe as long as Sanford, possibly even longer than that. But um, Haley is, Governor Haley was known for greatly trying to accelerate debt payoff, which I think is a worthy goal. And we've made a lot of progress on that. So our general obligation debt is way below the debt ceiling right now as a result of that. Um, however, the question is, what is the appropriate... Um, amount to accelerate and then it becomes more subjective obviously you have to make the minimum payment right but the question of you know if i have a mortgage and my monthly payment is 500 dollars, i have to make 500 dollars. i don't have to make 600 or 700 or 800 those may be worthy goals mm -hmm. but if my toilet just broke should i borrow more money to pay for the toilet or should i reduce my overpayment on my mortgage to pay for the toilet. You understand what I'm right, saying? Right. So there's a fiscal responsibility question that comes into play there. This, uh, a few years ago, was one of those hidden pots of money. So what was happening is by like, it was the year I was trying to get the uh, local government fund fully funded. And by working with the governor's office, I found out what the actual debt payments were. And it was like, oh, yeah. they were overpaying by like $130 million. And our shortfall on local so government like funds was like $110 million. Yeah. And so what I did is I proposed to reduce this line item to, to fund that. Gotcha. And I worked with um, some others. There was, there was a bipartisan effort to do that. Um, so that's just one example of, you know, where things. So 
there is a, a proviso actually that authorizes them to, to take the overpayment if we allocate more than is actually needed. To, to, there's a proviso instructing them to use that to accelerate debt payoff. And you'll find that in proviso 112, where is it? 112, 112.2, excess debt service. Excess debt service funds available may be expended in the fiscal year to pay down general obligation bond debt for which the state is paying at the highest rate of interest. So we're prioritizing paying down the, the most expensive debt that we have and two, we'll achieve relief in constrained debt capacity, or three, reduce the amount of debt issued. So we kind of give the state some leeway to, to pick and choose which ones we pay down faster. But uh, in previous years, if you can go back and compare previous year's budgets, you'll see different language in here, allocating some portion of that overpayment to other things. So that's how that was done. Um, By the way, there was a bill filed. Occasionally we'll take proviso language that's been sitting here in the budget for years and we'll pass legislation that just takes the language from that proviso, puts it into a bill to put it in statute permanently so we can take it out of the budget. Uh, there was a bill right across the desk today to take proviso 34.45 on page 370 uh, relating to birthing center inspections and um, uh, Chairman Smith and I work together on a bill which will come up right after budget um, on April 6th to, to deal with that. Um, and then if that, if that ends up passing and the Senate ends up passing it, then, you know, when the budget comes back from the Senate in May, then we'll probably take that out. Okay. Um, so, all right. When you get to the end there are some alphabetic indexes so if you're wondering okay i can't remember which which one is clemson university um you, there's a there's an index at the end of the page and it'll tell you you know what section it is it's uh clemson university is section 14 and that's on page what page is it is that 34? kind of need a ruler to look at these okay yeah page 34. Um, your indexes, uh, and then then it's, uh, see, I think there's another index sorted by section number here, so if you need a summary of, of which state agencies are covered in this. By the way, there are some state agencies that are not covered, and that, that means they're just, they're funded through some other mechanism, not by the state, um, or they're under another agency that is funded in here. So, for instance, the... Um, the Federal Small Business Assistance Agency, SBA, or Small Business Administration, rather. That's what the SBA stands for. We have a state um, subsidiary of that, uh, which is comprised under federal law. Mm -hmm. It's, well, where is that? You're not gonna find South Carolina SBA any, in here anywhere. Um, where you'll find it is, it does exist as an agency, but it exists it is administered by multiple universities. So it's administered by the University of South Carolina um, and two or three other universities spread around the state. So, so it's within those places. Yeah. yeah. And their funds will show up most likely in the total funds column, not broken out necessarily in their own line item. Uh, all right. There's also a proviso index for part 1B by section number, by alph alphabetically and by section number. And that's the end of that. Now let's, let's set that aside for just a minute and let's talk about the summary control document. They used to print those for us. I do recommend you print a copy if you like using the physical copies mm -hmm. of this stuff. Um, so if you go back to the, the Ways and Means Committee page and go to um, Budget Summary Documents here at the bottom, there is listed a Summary Control Document. Okay. Now, this is the one that shows everything and how it all fits together. This isn't in the same order 
as in here. It's not, it's not in section number order, which is a little confusing. Um, the section number is going to be shown here in this column, third from the left. Uh, and then the leftmost column is line number. So if you need to refer to a specific line on a specific page yeah, in the summary control document, that's how you can do it. Uh, but, you know, for instance, there's uh, section 106, employee benefits, section 107, capital reserve fund, section 112, which we just looked at, debt service. Um, and the summary control document has several columns across the top. So part 1A recurring funds, House Bill 4100. If a line item was changed, for an agency in Part 1A, if there was a change from last year, it's supposed to be highlighted here okay. in the summary control document. And it'll have a little line stating what that increase was for. So for instance, 2022 health insurance increase, $5.9 million in Part 1A recurring funds. Okay. So if you're looking at, if you can look at, let's look at uh, Part 1A, Section 106. That would be page 248. Actually, no. Oh, I had it right. 106. <clears throat> okay. They're not showing what the previous year is, so this is probably a bad example. Um, but not really sure. This may be, I'm going to have to ask staff what's, what's up with this. Usually they, there are numbers from the last year's budget and you can see a clear increase. Mm -hmm. And that, that will correspond to this line on the, uh, in the summary control document for that column. Uh, up here we can see, well, let's, let's look at a different example here. Um, Let's find a simple example. Okay. Um, there's not too many examples for non-recurring proviso spending. Okay, here's a good one. Here's a good one. Okay. So if we look at um, section 33 in part 1A, this is um, health and human services, starts on page 82. All right, if we look at the summary control document for HHS, we'll see several changes here. So part 1A, we see maintenance of effort annualization. So $16.5 million. They don't tell us necessarily what page in section one, um, 1A that shows up in, but there will be one or more line items that comprise that difference of $16.5 million. So that's how these two documents tie together. Uh, then you'll also see Medicaid Management Information System. This is funded in the second column, non-recurring proviso 118.18. So that's 16.678 million. That shows up here in the budget document. Um, in the Appropriations Act uh, on page uh, 500 and, okay, yeah, 530 on line three and four. You'll see Medicaid Management Information System, 16,678,434. That number matches the number shown on, this, on the sheet here. Oops. So that's how these two are tying together. Uh, then you'll see some other columns. So capital reserve fund, that's this bill. Okay. Separate legislation, uh, there's a state uh, reserve, capital reserve fund that has to be funded every, every so often. Um, I believe that's enacted in the constitution. Uh, the total spending in this added up is about $178 million. And uh, this is one-time money. And so you, you can see all these different line items in this right, thing. So 
Uh, most of it's colleges and universities. But so that money is in addition. So the overseas does money in addition to what's in this. Yes. Okay. Yes. This and is, is there a lay out how they spend that or that's just whatever they what do you mean like how it's designated with the provisos here no no these are just line items there, okay. there are no provisos in, in this um so uh that's where that's that's where you'll find those figures so uh so like 21 winthrop university um you can see it's getting seven and a half million dollars in the capital reserve fund for maintenance renovation and replacement and then another 2.5 million for dining facility renovations that's here in house bill 4101 on where's that number 21 um winthrop that's on page three here so you can see the seven and a half million and the 2.5 million so that's how all that works uh state total funds, federal funds, other funds, total funds. So if you want to know how the federal funds break out in that other funds column, wait a minute, make sure I'm using correct type terminology. In the Appropriations Act, in, um, in uh, Part 1A, you'll see total funds and general funds, total funds and general funds. It doesn't actually tell you how much the other funds are here. You have to figure that out by subtracting general funds from total funds. The difference is the total other funds. Okay, now some portion of that are gonna be the federal funds. You have to refer to the budget summary document to get that number. Um, so for instance, Winthrop University, you can see they're getting a total of 20 million, well, total state funds from everything, you'll, you'll see they're getting $30,193,076 from the state, mm -hmm. plus $51.2 million in federal funds, plus $101 million in other funds. Okay. okay. Additional other funds besides federal funds. So most of that is going to be tuition. Okay. And so that makes their grand total bottom line $182 million. 182.7 million. Um, let's see, what section is that? 21. 21. You'll see that the Appropriations Act shows a grand total total funds, page 62, line 28, a total of 172,707,131. So that's different, that's almost $10 million, or that's exactly $10 million different than the total shown here. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the difference? Well, this shows subtotal incremental adjustments, $10 million. The difference is coming from the CRF. Okay. So that shows that in order to get the total bottom line, you have to add up what's here with what's here. Okay. And of course, the budget summary control document does add that up for you, so you can refer to this to get the total, total, total bottom line for everything, for each agency. Um, there was something else related to that that I was going to cover. No, I don't remember what it was. Oh, yes, uh, FTEs. So, uh, probably the number one thing we spend the most money on are employees. Salary, it's true in business too. Uh, so, in addition, and this is by house rule, I believe it's in 5.3, that in addition to showing how much money we're spending, we also have to show how many employees, how many full-time employee equivalents units that corresponds to. So, you will see in here, so let's say Department of Social Services, Section 38, uh, you will see these these numbers. So, for instance, D, uh, line seven has uh, Section D, Adult Protective Services. You'll see some line items under that, and then line 13 total for that for that subsection, APS case management. We see a total of 3.2 million dollars, and then under that you see a 91.00 in parentheses. That means that they're paying 91 full-time employee equivalent okay. out of that. And then over here under general funds, 0.68. So 
So there are some part-time employees being funded out of that. Um, and then, you know, when you get to the grand total on page, um, on page 115 of the budget, you'll see the total bottom line other funds for the agency is $809 million. And out of that, they're paying 4,935.14 full-time employee equivalents. So that's a lot of employees, almost 5,000 employees. Some of those are gonna be full-time, some of them are gonna be part-time. So that's how that works. So sometimes that's, that's something to watch. If, you know, are they adding more employees in addition to more money? If so, what's that for? Make sure you understand what's going on there. And so like this one's like, they're getting a raise. Right. Yeah, they're getting a raise. So if the number of employees isn't going up, but the right. money's going up, then the agency is getting more money. So the question is, are they paying that to the employees or are they using that for programs? Okay. And that's where you can drill into some of the line items and study what's actually going on okay. here. So figure out where the changes are in here and the budget control document will help highlight that. So let's go to, this is section 38. Let's find section 38 here. Um, it should highlight that. 38, yep, here we go. Okay, so we can see that Department of Social Services getting, uh, there's, a, there's a change in Part 1A, a 20 million increase, uh, and that's for a program, Caring for South Carolina's Children, Child Welfare, Welfare Programs, $20 million out, allocated for that, mm -hmm. in additional recurring revenue in addition okay. to what they got last time. And that's what that's, what that's, so that's for. That's what that difference is. And then in, in the non-recurring proviso, five million in one-time money for the same purpose. So they're getting 25 million um, for that. And then down here, federal funds adjustments, caring for South Carolina's children, child welfare programs, same program, they're getting authorized to request another 20.678, 20.679 million dollars from the federal government. So my guess is there's some matching funds going on here or something like that, mm -hmm. which staff could confirm if you're interested. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're, not paying, that doesn't mean they're depriving employees of a pay raise. What that means is they're getting more money to spend on a new program. Okay. Now they, they may have to hire additional employees. So if you see, you know, some indication in here that they're, they, they in this case they're not, but sometimes programs also come with new employees to run the program. So, um, but in this case they can do it with their existing employee base. Uh, let's see. A lot of moving parts here. Uh, occasionally, I have asked staff if I can't find in here the corresponding item to one of the line items in here, I'll ask staff. They're always real helpful. On rare occasions, I've even caught mistakes in here. This is the authoritative document. This is here for convenience only. So just be aware of that. Um, this is what we're voting on, not the budget uh, summary control document. Um, but it should all correlate. Yeah, it should. All right. Um, there's a another rule I want to highlight, and that is sometimes prior to debating the budget, um, Revenue and Fiscal Affairs will say, we're getting X amount of money in. Let's say we're getting, we expect to get $10 billion worth of tax revenue. And the Ways and Means Committee comes out with a budget that only spends $9.8 billion in recurring revenue. Well, that leaves $200 million in recurring revenue unallocated. Mm -hmm. now, they may have done that on purpose, and staff will be able to explain that to you. And that's where the usually they'll highlight something like that in the budget briefing PowerPoint that was emailed to us yesterday. Um, that's also on the website here, so you can go through and see what they have to say about it. This is, you know, they're going to describe the the highlights of what they've done in the budget. Um, so, if they deliberately underspent in terms of the budget, they didn't spend every dollar that, that they believe is going to come in, then there's probably a reason for that, so know what that is. But it is possible to amend the budget to spend some or all of that money. And that's called unallocated money. There's, let's pull up the house rule related to that. 
because there's something I want to make sure you know. If you don't know this and don't, you're going to get on the house floor and you're going to, somebody's going to come up with some amendment and you're going to be like, what in the world, where are they getting the money for this? You know, and so forth. Um, house rule 5.3. Is it A? Let's see, 5.3 B. Okay, yes, all right, here we go. The One of the last sentences here in Rule 5.3 B says, provided if an amendment identifies unspent projected revenue or balance as the funding source. So you can instruct staff to draw you up an amendment to say that out of the unallocated balance, we're so going to spend X revenue. amount for this. Okay. Now, there's a, there's a rule here because that amendment may or may not be in order by the time you get to it. So if, somebody, if 10 people ahead of you have amendments saying yeah, they're expensive. funding their projects out of the unallocated balance, you better be paying close attention to understand which of these paths and keep a running tally of what the actual unallocated balance is. Because by your, t by the, you know, let's say you started with $200 million and three reps get up and they pass amendment spending 150 million out of 200 million and you wanted to spend, you know, 60 million. Well, now the money isn't there for that. And so, so your amendment. amendment would be subject to a rule 5.3B point of orders that says the money ain't there. Gotcha. So you'll have to be prepared to move quickly with staff to to address that. And you'll, you know, the only way you're gonna have a chance of having enough notice that that's happened is if you keep that running tally as you go through, um, which means you're gonna have to read the amendment carefully and note where they're getting the money. And if it says it's from the unallocated balance, you start subtracting money from whatever the unallocated balance is. Um, and you can go and ask staff at any time, how much unallocated balance is there? Daniel Bone should be doing what I just said mm -hmm. as well. And if you get confused or aren't sure about your figures or something like that, you can always check with him. Um, and of course that doesn't apply if the amount you're asking for is less than a million dollars. So you can still do it. And then the chairman will have to figure it out at the end, if it passes, where to, where to get the money. But if you don't, he could cut yours. Well, he, he'll, he'll have to cut from somewhere. Uh, the rule says the provisions of this paragraph shall be narrowly and strictly construed with regard to all provisions of and amendments to the appropriations bill and supplemental appropriations bill, which means it doesn't matter if it's a part 1A amendment or a part 1B proviso amendment. They're going to use the same standard when they're looking at Germanus um, in regards to that, what we just talked about. Um, okay, there's one other thing that I want to make sure, one other nuance here. Uh, occasionally you may hear somebody say something about wish list funding. Now this isn't really a, this is a, not a practice that really happens in the state house, uh, house uh, Ways and Means Chairman Merle Smith and, and others before him have always discouraged this practice. Um, but the Senate does sometimes engage in this practice. So Proviso 118.18, the uh, non-recurring revenue, the thing you need to understand here is each one of these line items mm -hmm. are prioritized. So it's kind of like a bankruptcy proceeding or something like that. The order of creditors that you get paid off is significant because people higher on the list are more likely to get paid off and people at the bottom of the list are less likely. Same, same goes here. So um, Office of the Adjutant, Adjutant General, He's very likely to get fully funded, but you go down to the bottom of the list and find Department of Administration, Division of State Human Resources, Class and Compensation Reform, $500,000, they may or may not get funded. Gotcha. So if something happens with one of these estimates where we think we're getting all that non-recurring revenue and that estimate ends up being lower, then we're gonna cut this provisor from the bottom up. So when we run out of money, anybody after that point, they're not getting funded. Now, wish list funding would be deliberately going beyond 
the point where we have money. So it's de deliberately overspending in this proviso. Gotcha. And wish list would be at the bottom of the list. Wish list items would be at the bottom of the list. And it would, if you add up the whole entire list, it'll be more than the, than the non-recurring money available. And the only reason you would even do that would be is if you're making a bet that the economy is actually going to do better than the people than, the, than RFA has estimated. And they're going to revise their budget number upward. We think we're, we're taking a gamble that the, there's going to be a surplus right. by the time this goes into effect by July 1st. And so obviously, you know, chances, the, the, the probability of that may vary, but you know, for that to happen, everybody ahead would have to get fully funded and then there's still be money left. So you run the risk. You run a big, a big chance on that. Yeah. Um, so that, th those are the basics. Uh, highly recommend reading all the rules pertaining to the Appropriations Act. Oh, some process stuff. Let's talk about some process stuff. So we'll start at 1 p.m. on Monday. This bill uh, has been set for special order, which means we can't debate anything else other than this bill next week. And that's going to remain true until this bill gets second reading. That's what, today. That's what, yeah. did today. That's what those, the, those motions were about. Um, any bill in the House can be set for special order, but the Appropriations Act is special and there's a different process for putting it on special order and it just requires the chairman to get up and make that motion and it's a simple majority. Um, now what's gonna happen, and what the speaker may have, may or may not have told you so far, is that um, we vote by roll call, section by section. There are what, 118 sections in part 1A and then 118 more sections in part 1B. So when he said on the floor, what was it, this, was it today? Or no, it was yesterday. Yesterday evening, he said, if you don't show up on Monday, you're gonna miss like 200, 200 votes. votes. That's he wasn't, he wasn't kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so what's gonna happen is people are, are working on amendments right now. And if you wanna do anything, you need to get with staff today and start working on them because the closer you get to Monday, the more their backlog is gonna increase and the you know, the harder, more difficult time they're gonna have of actually getting your amendment in a timely fashion. But, um, and, and also you wanna get your amendment on the desk as soon as possible. Be because what happens is on Monday, when we start at one, we're gonna start going through and the speaker's gonna look, oh, there are no amendments on section one of the budget. Uh, we're now voting on section one of the budget. Roll call is ordered. And it's gonna be a short roll call too, because we got a lot to get through. So he's gonna be asking for unanimous consent to close the roll call period early. Boom, we've moved on to the next section. Once we've voted on it, that section is considered closed and no amendments are in order at that point. There are some procedures to reopen it after the fact if that happens, but don't count on it. It's, it's better to have your amendment on the desk in a timely fashion so the speaker will say, oh, this, this uh, section has three amendments on it. We're passing over section one and go to section two and so forth. Because it's going to hit the ones. So what's going to happen on Monday is the only thing that's going to happen on Monday is we're going to vote on all the sections that nobody has any amendments to. And then we're going to go back to the ones with amendments. Um, Probably Tuesday. We may we may go through two passes. So let's say you have uh, section one is first up, Department of, of Education, and you are working on an amendment, but you don't have it yet. You're not done. Mm -hmm. You can tell, you can make the motion, tell the speaker in advance, you're gonna make the motion to pass over section one. And he'll do that for you. No, there's, there's no problem with that. There's no controversy about that. He'll do it. Doesn't matter who's asking, he'll pass over it one time. Okay. That buys you hours usually. So we'll go all the way through this budget. We'll go all the way through part one any sections that have no amendments and that no one asks to pass over will vote on and those sections will be closed and that means that's another reason to take this this recap page and and just check off you know which or strike through the ones that have already been closed so you know so you can keep track gotcha. uh, and then separately in part 1b we'll go through and do the exact same thing with all the proviso sections so section one department of education provisos 
Any amendments? Anybody want to pass over? If not, we'll vote on it. We'll close it. And then at the, after we've gone all the way through one time, then we'll come back around and we'll start over. And we'll revisit and the speaker will look again. Okay, you, Dion, you, you asked to pass over section one. Are there any amendments to section one? No? We're voting. <laughs> so, you know, you have that window of time to work with to get your amendment on the desk, but if you don't have it on the desk, you can't count on it staying open on Tuesday. So we'll go back through, and there will be a handful of sections like that that were passed over, and you'll look and see, okay, did anybody, did they, did they get their amendments on there? If not, we're closing. And, um, and that way, when we come back on Tuesday, which usually I think it's at 10 a.m. on Tuesday, um, expect it to be a very long day, and we're going to start in Section 1A with whichever the first section was that has amendments on it, and we'll start debating each amendment. And it's the same rules as any other bill's amendments. You know, you get up to 20 minutes in two 10-minute increments. Anybody can speak for or against. Uh, you can, you know, if the section is open, as long as the section is open, you can put amendments up at any time, um, even during the amendment debate. And then when you get through all the amendments, then we vote on the section. Just like we were given second reading to a bill, but it's just a section of the bill. Um, and we'll go through that, and that takes a long time. We'll go all the way through, all the way through, do the same thing with provisos as well. Um, probably the speaker's going to want to at least get through all the contested portions of Part 1A by the end of the day Tuesday, um, depending on how many amendments there are. Usually the provisos get a lot more amendments, and that's where things really start bogging down. So. Um, Depending on what it looks like, we'll probably start into that on Tuesday. Uh, we may even finish it on Tuesday. We have before. Um, and, and if we do, what that looks like is there may or may not be any breaks for lunch or dinner. We may start at 10 and go nonstop until 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. or 12 midnight. Uh, if we can get to second reading on Tuesday, um, by the way, even if midnight happens, it's still considered Tuesday, legislatively speaking, until we adjourn. Until that motion to adjourn, you're still in the same legislative day. So what that means is we get to second reading in the wee hours of the morning on Wednesday. We could, and we have before, adjourn and then reconvene immediately and then give the bill third reading and then everybody go home and sleep and catch up on work or whatever, let staff catch up. Make sense? Yep. Um, so just bring your lunch with you, bring your dinner with you, have staff ready to bring stuff into you into the cookie room if you need to. Occasionally, uh, Cox's will bring in pizza into the cookie room and we'll be back and forth eating pizza and coming back in to vote and stuff like that. So, um, but this is on special order and depending on how controversial it is, uh, how much debate discussion there is, how, how long people take, you know, and then you get through all the amendments and then the same rules apply to this bill like any other. People can start speech making for an hour and a half per person if they want to before second reading of the budget. So, um, and yes, the rule allowing the bill to be, anyone requesting the bill to be read applies to the budget too. That's why uh, a rule change was proposed saying that if you're going to do that, you got to stay in your right, seat right. the whole time <laughs> to try to discourage that because <laughs> some members were threatening to have yeah. this whole thing read. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, but, yeah, just be prepared for some really, really long hours on Monday, Tuesday, if necessary, Wednesday, even Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, as long as it takes until this thing passes. We're going to be here until it passes. Now, I've never seen it go past Thursday in the last six years I've been in office. But in theory, it could. This probably shorter than what y'all Yeah, this is, there's less in yeah. here to fight over, I guess. <laughs> but then it comes back after it goes to the Senate. Yeah, so it goes over to the Senate. Um, the Senate will go through subcommittee and full committee process, just like the House did. They'll pass some version of it uh, sometime in April. It'll come back over, what we think, sometime in April. Um, uh, we adjourn sine die. The end of session is usually the second Tuesday in May. Um, 
and uh, we'll be allowed to come back into special session if we need to to deal with this and a few other things. But generally speaking, the Senate will pass us a version of the budget sometime in April, mid to late April. We'll take up Senate amendments on the budget. Um, typically, what happens is the Ways and Means Committee introduces Amendment 1 at that point to the Senate version of the budget, and they'll they'll do some combination of things. They may take it and revert it back to whatever the House passed, uh, or they may take it and revert it back to what the House passed with certain selected items from the Senate version that they're adopting. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you gotta have it ready and on the desk, but after that, anybody can throw up any number of amendments. And in years past, dozens if not hundreds of so amendments have gotten filed. Well, okay, so yeah, if there's another if there's another RFA estimate, um, BEA, Board of Economic Advisors, is a subsidiary of RFA. Mm -hmm. So don't confuse, get confused on terminology. So BEA are the actual people that do the estimate under RFA. Um, so if the BEA comes out and says, uh, it looks like we're going to have another $50 million to spend in recurring revenue or something like that, then yeah, I mean, that could be something... Um, and if, if the budget has already passed in both chambers and gone to the governor and then they come out and say, oh, you got another hundred million to spend, then at that point we may introduce a supplemental appropriations bill. So a second bill that says, okay, from the surplus money, this is what we're going to do with it. That's happened once since I've been here. That happened, that did happen in 2015. Um, so, but yeah, that once once it comes back from the Senate, there will be a second opportunity for House members to amend the bill. By the way, any amendments, um, any amendment votes at that point, and this is true for any other bill that starts in the House, goes over the Senate and comes back, any further amendments uh, are automatic roll call votes. So um, that's not true when we take the first pass next week. Um, you only get a roll call on an amendment or a tailing motion if 10 members requested. But when it goes over and comes back, then at that point, it's an automatic roll call. Um, I imagine there will be a lot of this going on. Probably. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. So um, it does tend to help. There's no right or wrong way to do it, but sometimes it helps if you talk to the Ways and Means chairman in advance. Staff are required to keep stuff confidential unless you tell them otherwise. Okay. Um, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Um, also, legislative council may be they may be assisting ways and means staff, but ways and means staff are going to be the ones doing the actual drafting on budget amendments because it's such a specialized thing, and they know all the details and relevant information related to all that. So. That's something else I actually need to point out. This is this is important. Who do you ask to draft your amendment? Um, so the budget is divided up into subject areas. So like higher education, uh, K-12, uh, law enforcement, you know, public health, various things like that. And there are subcommittees under Ways and Means for each of those mm -hmm. that deal only with the agencies in those categories. Um, that's all broken out in the budget briefing, but also on the Ways and Means Committee page, you'll see budget subcommittee assignments. This is this is how you know um, who to talk to uh, for each of those subject matter areas. So if you want to do an amendment relating to one of the colleges or universities, then you need to go and talk to A.J. Newton on staff about drafting your amendment. So this, this is where, and you may want to go and talk to the, the chairman of that subcommittee and the members of that subcommittee and make sure they don't have any objections. Or you may choose to roll the dice, keep it to yourself, throw it out on the floor and, and let the chips fall where they may. Um, either, either way. And then in addition to these subject, uh, subject area specific staffers, like Little Field, Constitutional, Kinsey Riddle, Public Education, and so forth, um, Daniel Bone is over all of them. So if you're not sure who to go to, go to Daniel. Um, 
Katie Turner helps him. She's the one that actually sent out, emailed out the About budget, budget yeah. presentation. Uh, she's budget director. So all of their staff have been extremely professional in my experience, very easy to work with, and they work really, really hard. So by the way, there is a special proviso uh, subcommittee itself. Um, that's kind of a general catch-all thing. Um, so just understand that they are gonna be working very, very hard for us. They're not gonna get much sleep um and uh it's it's nice to just notice when staff is working really hard for you and doing a good job um so cool. i think that's everything uh it will help them out the sooner if you know you're going to do something the sooner you get it to staff to start working on the amendment the better they can email you back a pdf you can review it give them changes if needed and tell them when you're ready to have it filed and they can print it and put it on the desk for you. Okay. Or you can have them print it and bring it to you to file. Um, I think that's everything. By the way, if you are drilling into something, uh, some agency's budget and you wanna see what happened in subcommittee, you know, because that agency had had to come and present right. with their what they're asking for and, and so forth, a lot of times those are gonna be under budget subcommittee meeting handouts and there's usually archives of all that. So you see all the like higher education, drill into that and you can see, okay, South Carolina State University, click into that, here's their budget presentation. Here's what they presented to the committee. And you can you can go and study all that if you want to. We have the added benefit this year that because all those were recorded and live streamed, you can actually go back and watch the committee meeting if you want to. So depending on how detailed you wanna get on this. Yeah. So, anyway. All right. Um, one final thing. If you need to go and look at previous year's budgets and you're wondering how to get there, or if you're wondering how to get to the online version of this document, uh, the way I usually get there is on this left sidebar, blue sidebar, click on research. And uh, what time is it? 1.18. Oh, shoot, I missed my 1 o'clock call. Uh, research and then uh, search current and archived legislation and then budget bills. If you click into that, uh, you'll see the current one is going to be listed first. Uh, and then you can click, uh, each version of the budget will be listed out here. So right now there's only one version, um, and that's the version as introduced by the House of Ways and Means Committee. So click on that, then you'll see an index of all part 1a so you know if i click on that section i'll see a digital version of what's printed in this document or if i want to look at provisos then i'll click on under part 1b provisos sections listed separately click on that i can click on section one and boom there's the online version of the proviso section printed in this document uh, where do you find the recap the recapitulation um, it's going to be in the part 1a section at the very bottom recapitulation so after section 115 you click on that there it is i'll usually oops copy and paste all this into a spreadsheet and then i can play with the numbers gotcha. um, so, and anyway, you get to previous year's budgets the same way. So if I want to go back and look at the 2016, 2017 budget, I can do that. I can see what the ways and means introduced, what the Senate committee and the Senate passed, what the House amended, what the conference committee did. It usually does go to conference, by the way. So the House and Senate never agree. And so it goes to a conference committee, three members of the House, three members of the Senate get together and they go line by line and they figure out what they're going to do. Um, and then that committee report will come to us to be voted on or go over there to be voted on. And then it goes to the governor and then he'll line out and veto about 25 or 50 things. And then at some point we'll come back either in late May or late June prior to Jan prior to July 1st. And you know we may vote on each one of those on whether we're gonna override his line item vetoes or not. But you know, if I wanna see what is the final version, I can click there, you know, and I can compare and see you know, how did it compare then versus now? What did we do then versus now and so forth? So if you need historical data, that's where you go to get it. Um, 
Make sense? Yeah, appreciate it. That's good. Because we, and I'll speak for all the freshmen, I think we have no idea what to say. <laughs> That's why I wanted to cover yeah. some stuff. Um, so, anyway, I uh, hope that helps. And, you know, staff, all the staff are really good to work with on any sort of procedural or rules issues. If you're, you know, Charles Reed, our clerk, is extremely easy to talk to and, and helpful and professional. And he'll keep anything confidential as well. Um, he's not going to relay to anybody that uh, Dion's looking at possibly X, Y, or Z. Okay. He's not going to say that. And it's actually bound by attorney client privilege on that stuff. Um, and the same goes for the Ways and Means staff okay. um, and everything. So, and if you uh, are sure where to go or, you know, have a question about something, you're welcome to call me or text me as well. Um, if I know the answer, I'll be glad to share it with you. Cool. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. Got some homework to do. For sure. Read the rule five. <laughs>